Yo, what's good, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to another Run the World Review. This is Season 2, Episode 6, entitled A New Hope. I, okay, now first of all, let me apologize because I have not reviewed Episodes 2 through 5, and I probably won't, so I'm not going to make that promise. But what I will promise is that once the season is over, I will do a deep dive, in-depth review look at Season 2. And I will review episodes seven and eight. Okay. I can't promise that. So forgive me. I'm sorry. Um, so if this is your first time coming to my channel, welcome. If you are a returning family member, you already know what it is and what it always will be. Be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe if you choose to. If not, just sit back, relax, and we're going to get right into this thing. Now, um, we see hope. You know what I'm saying? Hope is the bougie best friend of uh, Whitney. So she comes and there's this different aura about her. Even I notice, I'm like, okay, you know, because Hope is, you know, bougie, but she tends to call it like it is. So I'm like, why is she here? And what's going on with old girl? So Hope lets the girls know that uh, she's engaged. <laughs> and I, everybody was like, what the hell? Because Hope is very, you know, by the book, do what you're supposed to do. And it's like, we just saw you four months ago. Um, how are you engaged? So not only is she engaged, Hope is about to get married at the end of the week. So that throws the girls for another loop as well because everything that Hope is doing is so out of the ordinary for her character. So everybody is like, who is this man? So she lets them know that she uh, met him in Tulum when they were out there when Whitney was supposed to get married, but we all know that didn't happen. And she's been dating this guy ever since. And so it was very obvious that Hope and Renee have been communicating because their relationship, their dynamic, they seemed a bit closer. Renee seemed to uh, like confirm or affirm Hope in a lot of the things that she was doing. And you could tell that Whitney didn't like that. She was very much given the side eye about this whole dynamic with Renee and Hope. And so Hope wanted the girls, you know, to meet Francisco he was in town, um, and she wanted them, you know, to to meet this man that she was absolutely in love with. So the girls agreed that they would meet him. Whitney seemed a little bit reluctant, but, of course, she didn't want to seem like the odd man out. You know what I'm saying? She agreed to meet him as well. So then we see the girls minus Hope at this boutique. So they're kind of catching each other up, you know, as to what's going on. And Whitney was like, do you think Hope is doing this because of me? And I'm like, baby, how shallow can you be? This has nothing to do with you, but this is Whitney. And Whitney's in that mode of, I'm going to give her a little bit of a pass because I know she's dealing with the, I can't give her a pass because she's the reason why Ola called, called off the wedding. But I believe she's still going through her emotional state and she really hasn't flushed it out all the way. But to turn and make someone's wedding about you, Someone choosing themselves and choosing love about you. I'm going to need you not to think more of yourself than you want. I'm going to need you to come down out the clouds just a tad. Because baby girl, it ain't about you. And so Renee so eloquently told her, you know, she believes that Hope has not been confiding in her or talking to her. Because Hope is trying to spare her feelings. And that was the perspective that Whitney should have been looking at this in. But she wasn't. So I was glad that Renee made that statement. Because, you know... Whitney whole thing was, well, why is she talking to you and not me? And I'm like, well, girl, you cheated on your fiance. He called off the wedding. Don't you think Hope would feel like maybe her presenting her happiness to you would be a little insensitive on her part? So I love that Renee gave that different perspective for Whitney to just consider maybe this is what's going on. So then they started talking about the men in their lives. And as I stated in the review for episode one, I believe that Renee wanted that old thing back. I think she still wanted her uh, husband, Jason, because we find out that Jason and Renee are not divorced. They are just separated. And so we get a flashback. Well, before we get to the flashback, Renee is dating this multimillionaire by the name of Preston. He has uh, private jets. He can fly her anywhere, take her anywhere, spend as much money on her as he pleases she says the sex is good so she believes that she could marry him like she could really go all the way with him and I'm like Renee it sounds like you're trying to convince yourself baby so then we get this flashback of 
Renee and Jason and when they met for the first time. And the sparks were definitely there. You could tell he was feeling her. She was feeling him. And he was telling her, you know, that he's in grad school. Like, he had this whole plan, which was not to be broke. (laughs) That was his five-year plan, just don't be broke. But the interaction between them, it was a very short flashback, but it really went to show that when they first met, they hit it off very, very well. And I was grateful that we did get that flashback of them. So then we see Sandy. Sandy is a TA for Professor Baptiste. And so Professor Baptiste comes in and has a little talk with Sandy because she wasn't at some type of mixer they were having. And Sandy is trying to hide out from um, Matthew. I'm like, girl, please. You know, because her and Matthew, they broke up. He proposed. She declined it. And I'm like, uh, Sandy, you can't hide out across this damn campus. First of all, the campus is big enough. You might not even run into him. And if you do, Matthew will be okay. Matthew will be all right. And I'm proud of Sandy. I'm proud for the fact that she was not ready to get married. And so she did not accept his proposal. Unlike a lot of women, just by the mere fact that, you know, someone was proposed to, they feel like they are entitled to accept. And you're not. If you're not ready for marriage, if you're not ready for that that next step, you don't have to accept it. You don't just have to go along with the flow. You can't always choose yourself. And that's why I really I really do like the character of Sandy. And another thing I do like about her, and I give props to the creators and the writers of this show, is that she is such an intellectual being. And I love that it's presented in a way where she doesn't come off as thinking she's better than other people she doesn't come off as snotty she just comes off as someone who's just very acutely aware of policies and platforms and you know the way that social norms affect children and how you know all of these things just work together and I you know the um race theory I just love how she is presented as this intelligent person and it's not snobbyish and I really really do like that And so Professor Baptiste is telling Sandy that there's this fellowship coming up and they've had their eye on her. They want her to apply because basically if she gets this fellowship, they will basically pay her to write her dissertation. So she has two weeks to complete the application. And, um, and I, and I love the dynamic between her and Professor Baptiste. Professor Baptiste still come off like a no nonsense woman, but at the same time, She's still very much so in Sandy's corner, rooting for her to do well in everything that she believes that Sandy can achieve. So it feels good to see another black woman um, cheerleading and pushing and stretching Sandy to become her best self in the academic field. So the girls meet Francisco, okay? And Francisco is fine, in my opinion. But he looks like a starving ass artist, okay? He fits the description. And when you think about starving ass artists, Francisco face he is the epitome of that but he's fine and (laughs) being a woman who absolutely loves creatives like I love men who can sing who can rap who can write who can produce who can paint who can draw all of that like I love play an instrument I love an artsy type of man that is my thing okay and so seeing Francisco I'm like I understand why hope fell so hard I do and I remember uh, somebody, uh, t- uh, I think they tweeted about it, like, how in the world is um, Hope all into him after four months? I'm like, baby, I don't put no time stamp on love. I don't put a time stamp on what someone can feel in a certain amount of time because everything is different. I have an uncle. My uncle and my aunt been married, I think, 30 years. It was love at first sight. They didn't even know each other. And I think they met and got married within a few couple weeks, and they've been married for 30 years. So it's like I don't ever – put a timestamp on what someone can experience when it comes to love. Cause you just never know. You just never know about that. So the girls are at Renee house. So they're pre-gaming before they go to the club. Me and my friends used to do that. Like them drinks at the club cost too much money. We going to get a little sippy sip on at the house. We go to the club. We already feeling good. We might just get one drink while we're there, but they are pre-gaming and Renee got these, <laughs> these little, I don't know what I don't know what kind of cookies or danishes or whatever they had, but they looked like vaginas and all that good stuff like that. I said, "Oh, where y'all get this from? This is this is this is 
something. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. So in the midst of that, we get another flashback of Renee and Jason. And so Renee was trying to get this account. And it was like with molding of penises. And Jason allowed her to, you know, create a mold of his 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 friend. And um, to me, I guess it went to show that Jason really would do anything for Renee. And I'm like, why is she having these flashbacks? Like, she is really thinking about this man. Now, I'm going I'm to pause right there and I'm going to go to episode five. Episode five, Renee's grandmother passed away. And she was really going through it. Um, it was just a lot going on and she was very upset and in her feelings because her mother ended up selling an item that her grandmother promised her that she could have, or it was an item that her grandmother wanted her to have. And her mother ended up selling it. And if she didn't know where it was, she was trying to find it. And Jason comes in and saves the day. And he knew exactly what the item was without Renee having to tell him. And he went and bought it back. And he gave it to her. And she was so overcome with emotion. And in that moment, I'm like, girl, you girl, get your man back. Get your man. You love him. And they were having a moment. And then the pilot who flies Preston's private jet came in to let her know, you know, how much time they had before, you know, they were taking off. And you could tell Jason was hurt. And he was like, you know, maybe I'll see you when the band is in New York. And she was like, yeah, you know, you will. And I was like, oh, Take them back, Renee. Take them back. Fix the issues that y'all had in y'all marriage. I just think Renee moved too um, quickly when it came to ending her marriage. Now, I'm not saying what Jason did was right. He didn't cheat. It wasn't that situation. It wasn't the other woman. He wasn't cheating on her. But he did move money and use money that belonged to them both, and he did not consult her. Now, to me, I don't think that's grounds for divorce, but it's definitely, or, or separation. But I definitely think it's grounds for a stern conversation about why that could never happen again. So, I just, you know, I, I'm rooting for Renee and Jason to, to you know, to uh, reconcile. And so when we jump back into, you know, we come out the flashback, the girls go to the club. They're just trying to have a good time. Now they live in Harlem. The club they went to is in Brooklyn. So we get there, the girls having a good time and Whitney sees her, um, barista and she's like, Oh yeah, I get your drink all the time for you. Blah, blah. blah. And Whitney was like, yeah, so what you doing out here? And she was like, Oh, you know, my date brought me out here. Then the date just happens to be Ola's ass. I see. I say this by the blip. Ola is the girl date. Uh, what poetic justice, you know? And so um the girl could definitely tell that Whitney and Ola had some history. And Whitney and Ola had a little moment um together. They were talking and, you know, things of that nature. Whitney let him know that she was looking into purchasing a home. And he was like, you know, yeah, that's smart. And it definitely feels like in the midst of their conversation that Whitney did a lot of things that Ola wanted to do, whether she agreed with them or not concerning their relationship, as in how they're going to move, what they're going to do. No, they're not going to purchase a home. They're going to get married first. And it was so many things that made me feel like Whitney was just a go-with-the-flow type of participant in their relationship. It didn't seem like she really had a backbone. It didn't seem like she really stood up for herself. And I am not in any way in no way, shape, or form saying that Whitney was right for cheating on him because she was wrong as hell. What I am saying is I believe when you have been with somebody for a long time, you just kind of fall into these certain roles and you really don't think about how do you feel? What do you want? What would benefit you? And yes, in relationships, there are compromise, but it doesn't seem like there was a lot of compromise going on with them. It seemed like it was what Ola wanted. They did what Ola felt they needed to do. And I just really would like to see that conversation comes out because based on this episode, that's the vibe that I got from it. So we're at this wedding. Y'all, we at this wedding and it was a nice little wedding and everything like that. And, um... Hope and Francisco didn't even wait for the officiant to say anything. That officiant didn't say any mumbling word. Hope was like, I do. Francisco, I do. And they kissed, and that's what it was. I said, I ain't never seen nothing like that before. 
But Hope was so happy. And before we even get to that, I remember it was a part where Whitney was asking her, you know, well, how do your parents feel about this? Where are y'all going to live? How is this thing going to work? And Whit- and Hope was like, I don't, it doesn't really matter what my parents think. Like, they just excited I'm getting married just from the possibility of grandchildren. And she was like, I'm not really concerned. I'm happy. And I'm doing what makes me happy. And I think as women, especially when you're in your 30s, I'm just use that because I know they're in their 30s. There are a lot of things when you're talking about like uh, emotions and logic. And sometimes I think emotions have to rule over logic because sometimes logic will have you thinking or no, don't do this. Think about this. Think about that. And sometimes you can think yourself out of a wonderful opportunity. You can think yourself out of a wonderful relationship or the possibility of a relationship. Now, I'm not saying throw all logic out the window. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is sometimes when you have been lacking in something for so long and someone comes and presents something, you'll have that mode of this is too good to be true. Oh, now nah, he can't be this great of a guy or she can't be this great of a girl. And in reality, there are some amazing men out there. There are some amazing women out there. And because we have been scarred by life, you know what I'm saying? Or because we have been tainted by the cruelness of others or the mishaps of others or the mistreatment of others, we tend to look at other people with that same, through those same lenses. And we have to realize that not everybody is out to hurt you or mistreat you or take you for granted. There are genuine people out there who just want to love you for the person that you are. And it appears that Hope has found that for herself. So I was happy that we was able to see that dynamic um, happen for a character on the show even though hope you know kind of bounces in and out she's not a fixture on run the world but she's there enough for us for me to actually have felt very excited and happy you know what I'm saying for her so in that moment Renee looks at hope and Francisco kissing and she comes to the realization that she's still in love with Jason and she verbalizes that and her girls kind of look at her like what? I was happy Renee came to her senses. I'm like, girl, I saw that since episode one of season two. You still in love with your man. You want your man. Girl, go get your man. And it goes to show, too, Preston looks great on paper. Hell, great. Preston looks great just in general. <laughs> you know, he has the ability to go into rooms that Jason probably would never be able to get into. He has the funds that, the funds that Jason probably never will have. And even if that is so... Money, status, prestige, all of that stuff doesn't matter when your heart is not in it. And Renee's heart has been and is with Jason. That's why I really want to see them work it out. I really want to see them um, make their thing the way that it's supposed to be. So we're going to see y'all. I don't know. (laughs) As much as I said all of that, I don't know if Renee willing to give up the sex with Preston. Because it seemed like she enjoys it. But she seems like she enjoys, you know, her husband, you know, as well. So, y'all, we're going to find out what happens. So, um, I like I said, I promise I will review episode seven and eight. And then I will do an in-depth review of the entire season two, which is only eight episodes, um, once the season finale goes off. Thank you guys for listening. Like I said earlier, y'all just forgive me. Um, forgive me, girl. But um, <laughs> I thank y'all. And until next time, I will holler at y'all later.